Good evening, good evening. Um, so he, your book, here it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to, uh, maybe before we kick off, I just want to um, first of all say welcome to everybody and I want to also say why it was particularly special for me that you invited me to proofread your book. By the way, I didn't proofread it alone. I re uh, proofread it with a good friend of mine called Leila Anderson, who can't be here because she has a tiny son and he would not be able to manage to sit through an interview, but she loved doing it as well. Um, you didn't know this about me, but Leila and I both work in the field of theater and I actually, com completely coincidentally, I work as a voice coach. Um, I am a presence and voice coach, and so I was handed a manuscript of a book. I had no idea what this book was about, and I opened it, and I started reading it, and basically what I realized is here I've come into contact with the writing of somebody who is writing precisely about what I do, except I never had the words to describe what I do at all. I, I work very intuitively. Um, I've never, I just come from a practice as an actress, but I've never really researched that. And I, I just want to tell everybody who's in the room this evening, if you haven't yet ordered this book, order it. It's amazing. This woman is so smart. She's just, the way that she has brought theory and the emotional world together is really, really something very special. So thank you so much for inviting me to interview you and speak with you about the book. Um, that is more than enough about me. What we all wanna hear about is about you. Uh, maybe we can start by you telling us a bit about how that worked for you. How did you go from your experience as a performer to all the way at the end of the line, finally getting to the point where we're sitting here and I'm holding this book in front of you? Yes, how, how shall I put that nice and concise into a few words? You can speak as much as you <laughs> like. We're all here for you. Yes. So, um, I, um, I am a performer. I'm a singer. I've always liked singing. Um, I wanted to make that into a profession. And I, I tried that by the official way, by going to the conservatory, and, and you know, other music schools in the UK as well. And that didn't really work out for me. Why? You can read in a book. Um, and somehow that got me disencouraged about becoming a singer. And I started musicology, uh, a course in Amsterdam, which was also fine. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to, to sing in a choir just for fun, and that's it. I'll need a happy life. But one thing led to another, and then at some point I found myself performing, singing concerts. Um, and um, that was going well, but not always. And um, just like the first time I entered the stage as a teenager, I, uh, I kept on experiencing stage fright, as you also uh, read about in the book. It's something I experienced for the first time when I was 14 and I was about to sing a song on the piano at a performance. Um, and uh, I had no conscious awareness of my stage fright, but I noticed my hands were trembling and I didn't know what to play anymore. Couldn't find the words, couldn't find the, 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 the chords on the piano, so it's kind of a blackout. And that shocked me because I wasn't aware of that stage fright. And along the way, in my performances as, uh, as a classical singer mainly, the floating diva, which some of you may have seen, this was a recurring thing, and my voice was blocked at some points. I lost my high notes, I, uh, and I struggled to find them back again. Uh, and my singing teachers didn't really know how to help me. But along the way, I, yeah, I learned to, to set boundaries, I learned to regulate my, my emotions, and things got a lot better. As most performers do, they start to teach what they, what they practice. So I became a singing teacher. I've been doing that for about 10 years. Yeah, 10 years I'm a singing teacher. 
And from all these singing students came the uh, the question: Oh, can you can you sometimes help people who uh, who struggle with their voice but they're not singers who struggle with public speaking, for example? So I started doing that, and then especially more than the singers, even when I started working with people who struggle with their voice in other ways, I really learned about. Um, yeah, what's what's behind the voice, the the whole world of thoughts, of emotions, of beliefs, and how that affects the voice so much, and how you should also work uh, with that if you want to improve yourself on the level of voice. And from from that point on, I started studying, reading, doing courses, and. I found a lot of interesting theories that I'm combining now in my practice as a voice coach, and I decided to write them all up in a book. Uh, yeah, because there's actually what's really interesting about the book is that you, well, you will talk about it more later, but you dig in a, into a few different theories, um, but you also very much speak about the emotional realm, and you very much speak about... Um, how our voice is directly affected by the way that we perceive ourselves and the way that we move around the world and communicate with other people. I mean, if you had to say to everybody here now, you know, like, what is the relationship between those things? Or like, would it be possible for me to technically speak or even sing well if I were struggling emotionally? Or what, what is the relationship between those things? Um, I think this is where I should tell about uh, autonomic nervous system. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Tell us about the autonomic yes. nervous system. So this this is um, where it gets medical, and it's it's a good thing because if you if you have the feeling that you cannot control your voice, it has a physical cause most of the time, and the autonomic nervous system. Do you do you know where it is in the body? Do you know what it? Yeah, there is some there's you some doctor. There. <laughs> <laughs> it is the um, it is the oldest part of our brain, and it is. Uh, just right above the spine uh, here. And um, it's a survival mechanism to to help us stay alive. And it senses fear, it senses, it senses safety, it senses danger. Um, and whenever we perform, even though we want to perform, it is it is a sign of danger. There's always a, a, a yeah, a chance that you fail or that you won't live up to your own expectations, and that causes a stress reaction. Fight or flight. Maybe you know fight or flight or freeze. Well, the freeze, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar with all those states. <laughs> yeah. And the freeze is what I what happened with me at the uh, the the performance when I was 14. It's like blackout. That's a freeze. And when I give this context to people, it's, it helps already so much that, um, that there's, there's an actual cause for what many people are going through. And that, that really helps before you even start to work on solutions. The, um, the context is important. Good. So it's really about having both of these things present at the same time, which I think is probably why you wrote the book the way you wrote it. So maybe let's talk also a little bit about... You didn't, um, you didn't go down the classical route of, let's say, having somebody else publish that for you. You decided to self-publish, right? Yes. So could you tell us why that was so important to you in this case? Because I think it's connected. Yes. Um, there are quite some books about the voice already. I've, I've read some of them. And they talk about the voice mainly in a practical way. And they, they talk about uh, the larynx and the vocal folds and how it works together with your breathing and your articulation and the resonance in your system. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's nice. We have a lot of those books. But um, there is much more to it than that. The whole emotional world and the physical world, the, f the psychological world. And I... Um, I di dive deeply into a lot of theories, and the theories I have put together in part one of this book. And um, let's say that this book has two pillars, theoretically. One is the 
the polyvagal theory or the the theory about the one of the theories about the autonomic nervous system. And the other pillar is the theory of positive disintegration. And that is a personality theory by someone called Kazimierz Dabrowski. And both these theories gave me so much um, relief and context for everything I have been going through in my, not only in my uh, profession as a singer, but also in my life. It explains so much and um, I really wanted to get the, um, uh, yeah, was the under sustain boven. Mm -hmm. What is that in English? <laughs> uh, the bottom most rock to the top. <laughs> Yes, it's the same expression, it's the same expression. No, it's not, I'm making no, it's it not. up. I just don't know what else to say right now. <laughs> what is okay. it? Get to the bottom of it. That's Get to it. the bottom that's of it. it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I, um, I really wanted to explain, not only um, what you can do with your voice to improve things, but also why things are happening um, and um, and really get to the bottom of it. Okay, yeah. so let's just, I mean, obviously everybody here knows what polyvagal theory is and positive in in disintegration, And but let's just assume there's like one or two people in the room who might not know what you're talking yes. about. Can we get like the dummies introduction to these things in like one or two sentences so we kind of understand what you're touching yes, on? Yes, yes. Just in case. Yeah. So um, then let's start with positive disintegration. Okay. And I won't I won't um, give away too much because then it will take about half an hour to explain only the the surface. But I'll I'll give you one thing about this theory, and that's called overexcitabilities. Overexcitabilities um, are are what you can experience. If you have um, if you have a sensitive nervous system and and you, you yeah you get a lot of um, <coughs> imp no impulses uh, yeah, yeah. brain impulses in the brain and your system has to to work that through and it can either get you um, yeah quite intense on the emotional side but it also on the creative side on the intellectual side. And l like a couple of years ago, I found I found uh, that certain voice problems connect to these overexcitabilities. Mm. To give you an example, um, maybe maybe you you know this from yourself that when you, or maybe not, that when you are about to speak for an audience, you you want to do well and you really focus on the content and you you want to say it just right. <laughs> Sorry, you've got more guests oh, coming more guests. I'm just, hey. I'm just telling them they're hey. welcome. <laughs> hey, hello guests. <laughs> um, so you, you focus on the content, and then that goes almost always at the expense of the delivery. Right. Right? Yes. Yeah. Another example. Um, you start talking, you're improvising your presentation, and then you have an idea, oh yeah, I should mention this, oh, I should mention that, and that, and that. And then you are at some point, and then you know, what What was I saying? What was the point I want to make? Is that familiar? Yeah? <laughs> I see nodding heads, a sea of nodding heads, so yes, it's familiar, yes. And then, of course, there's the trembling voice, and the, when when you feel that you don't have enough air, and and your voice goes high pitched, and maybe a little when you speak a bit faster, and like and when you do this, but you really don't want to sound like this, and you cannot control it; it just goes past itself. Mm -hmm. so emotional overexcitability. Mm -hmm. So, does this does this give an example of these types of overexcitabilities and their relation to the voice? I, I'd say it's pretty clear. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty clear. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so the first, the first section of your book is really looking at the different theories that talk about how the voice can be overstimulated and also what might be done to counter that, right? Then, yes. Then there are actual practical exercises. So I just also want to mention that for me as a coach, this was fantastic to read because not only am I getting an insight into all these different theories, but I'm also getting to read what are some of her suggestions for actually working into that than in a practical sense. So I can use this for myself, I can also use it for the people that I work with. So 
I think that's fantastic. But then there's also another segment to the book as well. Um, and how would you describe that segment of the book? The second part. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, the second part is where I um, all the all the, the theory you had to, you have to plow through <laughs> in part one mm -hmm. <coughs> um, is necessary, in my opinion, to understand why you are doing certain exercises. Mm -hmm. It's good to mention that the exercises I give in this book they are not always directly related to the voice, mm -hmm. and this is where my my voice coaching is maybe somewhat different and why I feel I need to give a lot of context mm. because the exercises are about how to regulate your nervous system, mm. how to calm yourself when you are when you're stressed, when you're emotional, how to regulate your, your thoughts, mm. how to be more present if you are um, an another thing that, that, that might happen, it's, it's a good example of not being present, you're talking and you're thinking about what to say next. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that familiar for some people? Yeah, again here. <laughs> and that makes you um, not finish your sentences and you're tailing off. Um, and um, if that happens, I, I have exercises for for being being more present just in the here and now be with what you're saying and um yeah try to to be just with that sentence and don't worry about what comes later it you you know what to say it'll come mm. trust trust that so actually we are also getting a mindfulness training from you by reading this book would you say that's correct Yes, that's correct. So we're going to yeah. be like singing, <laughs> singing, <laughs> singing Buddhas by the end, hopefully. <laughs> but that would be chanting like Buddhas. Chanting yeah. Buddhas. <laughs> and um, and I remember specifically. I mean, uh, what's also nice is that you also share stories with us in this book. So it's not, you know, it's really not just theory. It's also we get to go on little journeys. And one story that you share in the book is uh, one of Marvin Gaye. And I was thinking maybe you could just like. Um, recap a little bit of that for us as well, because I think it also gives a nice window into another way that you write in the book, which I also think is very nice. I feel that you have these different writing styles, and it's nice how you really? kind of yes, oh. like okay. like more theoretical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've obviously like done your studies quite profoundly, but you're also a good narrative mm -hmm. writer. So, and I think that these things really come together very nicely in the book. So that's why I thought maybe oh. you can share a little bit of a Marvin Gaye anecdote with us. Marvin Gaye, yes. I, I wanted to show how um, through through a famous person that, that most of people know, someone like Marvin Gaye, how a personal transformation also um, sounds through in his voice. And in, in his particular case, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really good example. Marvin Gaye has been called the best soul singer of all time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, however, he himself had a very difficult situation with his own voice and his own career. Um, although people love his voice, he, he never thought his singing was good enough, especially in the beginning. And he, he suffered by st uh, stage fright intensely and sometimes didn't get on planes to, to gigs where he should perform because he was too afraid, not of flying, but of performing. And somehow, th these stories never come out, only in the biography that I read about him. And um, maybe you know his, his early songs, his Motown songs, they are quite, you know, nice love songs, duets. Um, and he has this really smooth tenor voice there. But then if you look at the point where he decided to um, yeah, to live more according to his own values, to, to express more of his own musical ideas, even though Motown didn't like that, um, you hear a completely different voice. And it's not the polished sound anymore. It's, it's really Marvin's own emotional struggles sounding through 
of course, also in his lyrics. But it's a really interesting transformation. And, and um, well, it didn't end well. He, uh, his inner conflict with himself and with his... Um, I think that his main conflict was uh, his, his, his longing for recognition and fame, but at the other side, he thought that was, that was not what he should desire, and he desired to, to contribute to the world in a different way. He wanted to, to uh, spread the word of, of, the, of the Lord, but he didn't do that, and he was in an extreme inner conflict, and uh, unfortunately, that, that made him, um, yeah disintegrate <laughs> there we have the term and um but it's uh, even though it didn't and well it's a really nice story that that i think connects to a, what a lot of famous artists need to go through mm. and obviously i mean there's a reason that you pick a story like this a, a story like that inspires you because you you feel connected to it in some way so if we if we look at the story of marvin gay how would you say how do you see yourself mirrored in it because to me it speaks of also having to kind of unpick a certain perfectionism um, and really choose an own path in order to find the voice that is most comfortable for you in a way. I wonder how you relate to that. Yeah, just as you <laughs> Or maybe you that's it. You I already said, said it for it. you. No, but it's, no, it's really <laughs> nice. I, I didn't really realize it, but at some point, a friend of mine was already reading the book uh, before, um, before it was out. Daniel, some of you might know him. And he told me, yes, this Marvin Gaye story is really, it's like your own uh, story with the voice. It's, uh -huh. it's quite similar. And, that, right. and it's, when he said that, I realized, uh, yeah, yeah, there are some similarities between the struggles um, we, yeah, we meet on our path, mm -hmm. but he's, he's a world famous soul singer. I'm not, mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> you still <laughs> could be, there's still time <laughs> after the book, after the book. Fortunately, I don't feel I, I need to do that, yeah, but that's good. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Nice. Um, and uh, I think we are about to wrap up, but I just wanted to tell people that although uh, this book is kind of divided into two pr pretty clear sections. In my personal opinion, there's kind of a third, almost secret section, which is right at the end, um, where you give us a little insight into what you actually feel is perhaps like the larger relationship between the way we connect to our voice and the way we connect to the world. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe you can just tell us a bit about that. Yes. Um, I didn't want to write a self-help book. And that's also um, why I have been self-publishing. So no self-help, but self-publishing. Mm. Um, because the one publisher that I almost started working with in the United States really wanted to make it about self-help. And although it is really good to um, to improve yourself, to to work on on personal development, um, I don't think it should ever be the end goal because uh, you should not just do it for yourself. If you come to a point, and I'm 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 not there yet, but but. It, it's a nice idea that if you if you have a completely regulated nervous system, if you have reached your personality ideal, that there then uh, there's much more space to contribute to the world, and you won't add that much to to uh, all the chaos and uh, and the suffering that's going on. Mm -hmm. Then you are um, much more open to. Um, yeah, to compassion and uh, and being there for others, and that that should be, in my opinion, the the goal of the self development. And are you speaking from personal experience? Um, well, I think that the way I I have been going through a process mm -hmm. last now well well for my whole life. I'm getting at a point where I'm now able to contribute better to the lives of others than I used to do in the past. 
Yeah. Nice. So the book works, everybody. <laughs> That's basically the the punchline and the and the sales quotes all in like in one wrapped up with a ribbon. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for this interview. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it? Good. Um,